without further ado, a uh, big round of applause for uh, our guest speaker this evening. Um, yeah, no, fine. Uh, I will, uh, talking on the, the, the topic of the Geek Manifesto, big round of applause please for Mark Henderson. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mike. Uh, th thank you, Marsh and Andrew, for uh, inviting me up here as well. Uh, it's, it's really great pleasure to, to come up here. I've been doing a, a number of skeptics in the pub uh, over the, the, the last few weeks. Uh, uh, there was a wonderful uh, occasion uh, about a month ago when I went down to the Winchester skeptics in the pub and they had a little flyer with their upcoming events and I looked down and there were sort of four names of speakers like David Nutt and uh, Alam Shaha who were sort of doing all the same things as me because they've got books out as well. Uh, and uh, I looked down and every single speaker on that flyer was in my book in some way, which uh, was, was just a wonderful moment. And, and uh, something I always uh, think, that, uh, and one of the reasons I'm so keen to do uh, Skeptics uh, events talking about uh, this book, is that actually I don't think the book could exist without uh, things like this, without events like this and people uh, like you, and uh, particularly the way in which Skeptics in the Pub has sort of uh, started to bring people together and and uh, uh, I was very uh, keen when I wrote a book about science and politics not to just make it a book about the problems but also to start to uh, look at the solutions as well uh, and and I think everybody in this room is is very much part uh, of that uh, solution so uh, before I get into sort of the substance of the book I thought I'd just uh, uh, say a few words about the cover that you can see up there uh, up top. Uh, I came up with the idea of doing this kind of uh, communist manifesto pastiche and uh, uh, the designer Leon came back with this wonderful, wonderful design and uh, uh, my editor and I loved it. Uh, I tweeted it and uh, most of my followers were saying that's brilliant uh, and then a few and then more and more and more uh, came back having noticed a, a fatal flaw which was that on the uh, original version of this, the fluid in the flask was parallel to the bottom of the flask. <laughs> and uh, the wonderful thing was not only did people start to, to spot that out, thinking we found our market, there really are a lot of geeks out there, uh, but also, uh, even better, they then started to come up with potential explanations as to how it could still be valid. Uh, maybe the flask was, uh, or the, the, the hand was spinning in a centrifuge, uh, for example. Uh, the, the other uh, thing about the cover is that it wasn't originally this uh, great shade of orange that reproduces so badly on the, uh, uh, on, on the slide here. It was a, a, a royal blue, and uh, we were about to go to press with that, and uh, another of the designers suddenly spotted uh, and said, you can't have it blue. Uh, and we asked, why can't it be blue? I said, well, if you look at the sort of white uh, stripes on the background there, on a royal blue background, it looks a lot like the Greek flag. And the Greek manifesto would have been quite a different book at the moment. <laughs> so uh, that's, uh, that's, that's kind of how we got there. I'm going to um, move on to this guy, uh, starting off with uh, plenty of booze. It's, yes, David Trudinick, the, uh, uh, the honorable member for Holland and Barrett, as uh, he's sometimes known, such as his uh, uh, love of alternative medicine. Now, um, I've, I've selected one of his uh, finest uh, comments from his parliamentary career here. Uh, at certain phases of the moon, there are more accidents. Surgeons will not operate because blood clotting is not effective, and the police have to put more people on the streets. Yes, this member of parliament stood up in the Houses of Co House of Commons and made a speech about the awesome power of the moon and how the, uh, uh, the Department of Health really needed to uh, uh, take more note of it. He also, incidentally, uh, claimed 700 quid uh, on his parliamentary expenses for astrology software, uh, which gives you some idea of, uh, of where this guy's coming from. Now, um, Tridinic uh, is, in a way, rather an unfair person to begin this talk on, because 
Uh, he isn't uh, particularly representative, thank God, of the uh, 650 uh, MPs in the House of Commons. There is only one of him. There is only one Nadine Dorries as well. Uh, but uh, there are very few of his colleagues who sort of are anti-science in a meaningful way, in the way that, uh, that Tradinic is. But nonetheless, uh, I think the very fact that he uh, has won three uh, elections and uh, uh, continues to serve uh, as an MP, uh, and uh, most worryingly, the fact that, that despite his rather odd views on uh, everything from homeopathy to, to the moon, I mean, it was a wonder that he didn't actually mention werewolves in this uh, particular speech, um, Despite these, the, these weird and wacky views, he was actually elected after the last uh, election by his Tory backbench colleagues to serve on the Health Select Committee. Uh, they probably all thought, oh, Tredinic, yeah, he's that one who's interested in health, isn't he? Rather than, let's put him on that committee, rather than thinking, my God, he's the guy we should keep well away from health. And I think that's illustrative of... Um, the real problem uh, in science and politics, which is not that politicians, by and large, are Tradinics, that they're anti-science. It's that they're the colleagues. They're, they're, they're the colleagues of Tradinic who, despite his odd views, have put him into a position where he's able to scrutinize health policy. Uh, it's indifference to science. And uh, there is, I think, this sort of disconnect uh, between science and politics there that ultimately uh, serves neither particularly well. So let's, um, let's go on to, to, to science in Parliament. There are, as I'm sure you know, 650 members of Parliament. Uh, there are 158 of those have a background in business. Uh, there are 90 uh, what you might call professional politicians, uh, 86 uh, solicitors and barristers from the law, uh, 38 people with a background uh, in the media, and um, how many scientists? Yeah. There he is. Uh, Julian Huppert, the uh, MP for Cambridge, Lib Dem, uh, is, is the only member of parliament at present who uh, has a, uh, a science PhD and has actually worked as a research scientist. There, there are uh, a couple more uh, MPs who have um, science PhDs. Uh, there are about 20 more who have a science undergraduate degree. Uh, there are a few medical doctors, a couple of engineers. Uh, and of course, if you, you can cast a net more widely than that. You don't have to be a trained scientist to understand uh, and value science. I'm not one myself. Uh, but uh, Equally, even if you do start to cast that net for, for people who've sort of shown any track record of uh, engagement with science, sort of active engagement with science, you don't get a very large number. Uh, at, the, at the times where I worked until recently, around the time of the last election, we did some, some research into this. We found about 70 uh, who had a, a decent track record of really showing uh, proper interest and, uh, and engagement with um, with science. Um, there are currently uh, in the cabinet uh, no cabinet members uh, who have a science background at all, science degree. Uh, Vince Cable started a natural science degree but, but switched to economics. Uh, the last cabinet, the Labour cabinet, uh, had two uh, out of, uh, I think it's 23, uh, Margaret Beckett and uh, John Denham both have. Uh, have, have science degrees. But it is, it is really vanishingly rare for politicians to have much foundation uh, in science. And why does this matter? Well, it contributes, I think, to this disconnect. Um, and I think it, it, it manifests itself in two uh, different ways. With, with little experience of science, what it's actually like to, to work in a lab, to apply for funding, to, uh, to do experiments, uh, I think that politicians very often uh, let down science when they come to manage it. Uh, and also, I think with a little broader understanding and, and kind of affinity for science, they... Uh, Sorry, what, what's making this go? It's somebody's phone. That's all right. We'll, I'll, I'll keep going. With, um, with, with little sort of uh, experience and, and, and sort of understanding of, of what science 
uh, means. Uh, they don't understand properly uh, how it can actually contribute, how the methods of science and the, 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 the approach to, uh, that science takes to problem solving uh, can contribute uh, more effectively to, uh, to better policy making. Um, so let's take the management of science first. Uh, you have this situation where uh, with, with so little uh, experience of, of, of doing science, when politicians have to take decisions that will affect science, they often uh, do them badly. Uh, a great example is the regulation of uh, medical research where there are a number of laws that have been brought in, the uh, uh, EU uh, Clinical Trials Directive, the uh, Human Tissue Act would be two uh, good examples that have created layer upon layer of uh, bureaucracy around doing research with human subjects in trials. Now, uh, some degree of regulation is, of course, essential. Uh, and uh, approval by ethics committees and, uh, and so on is vital. But this uh, paperwork has now mushroomed to the point that it very often becomes a barrier to this research taking place uh, at all. And um, Cancer Research UK, the, uh, uh, the charity, uh, estimates that from uh, the moment that it takes a decision to fund a clinical trial, to the moment uh, at which the first patient is recruited into that trial takes an average, an average, so sometimes much more than this, of 621 days, uh, which really isn't a good uh, way of running things. This isn't deliberate. Uh, politicians have not deliberately said, let's go and stymie medical research. They've taken decisions that have been thoughtless uh, because they don't actually understand the implications that those decisions will will have. Uh, another great example of that is the immigration cap brought in uh, recently. Now science, as, uh, as those of you who work in science or, 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 or who engage with science on a regular basis know, is an international game these days. It is impossible to do it relying purely on our own talent and EU talent. We need to bring the best people in uh, from all over the world uh, to collaborate. And uh, uh, to introduce an arbitrary cap on immigration, particularly one which sort of discriminates as to how talented you are on the basis of salary, uh, in science, as uh, I'm, I can see a couple of people chuckling at that, they're probably the scientists in the room, but uh, there is obviously something that anybody uh, who had worked in a lab would be able to tell ministers uh, straight up uh, would have been a, a, a big, big problem. So that's, that's one issue, but uh, it's not in many ways the major ones. There's, there's actually a, a, a second problem, which is that uh, without having studied uh, science or worked in science and, and without really having engaged with it at all, uh, I think that too few politicians uh, understand um, this about science. Carl Sagan's uh, wonderful remark that uh, science uh, is more than a body of knowledge. It's a way of thinking. It's what defines uh, the scientific approach to, 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 to problem solving. It's about basing your views on evidence, about uh, making provisional uh, discoveries about the world uh, that can be overturned and improved upon in light of better evidence. Uh, it's about observing, it's about testing, um, it's about doing experiments. And uh, I don't think that uh, enough politicians uh, understand that science as an approach to knowledge uh, is the single most powerful tool that humanity has yet developed for working out what is so and what is not so, uh, what works and what doesn't. And uh, that has so much potential to play a role in the policy-making process, and, and it doesn't. Uh, this, this manifests in a number of ways. You, you have the situation where uh, science advice is given to uh, ministers who, who reject it or uh, try to use it in uh, ways that weren't intended. Uh, you have incidents such as the sacking of uh, David Nutt, who I gather spoke to you uh, recently, is that right? Yeah, two weeks ago. Um, and uh, you, you, you have a situation where, where evidence uh, is often, uh, frankly, abused by politicians 
because they don't actually understand how it's supposed to be used. Um, what politicians often say is that they like to make evidence-based policy. Uh, but what they really value is something different. It's policy-based evidence. It's evidence that uh, tells them to do what they wanted to do all along and uh, uh, is there as an excuse for their policy rather than actually used to develop it. Now, um, the number of ways in which uh, uh, evidence is abused by politicians is, is so great that it is possible to, to draw up something of a, of a taxonomy. So you have uh, evidence shopping. This is the, uh, the, 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 the most basic kind of evidence abuse, where, which is the classic cherry picking. It's the uh, looking around for the policy evidence policy-based evidence that you need to kind of decorate your policy, make it look like it's got some foundation in evidence, whereas actually it was dreamt up for uh, completely different purposes. And uh, a, a great example of this would be uh, the way that Jackie Smith, when she was Home Secretary, uh, treated evidence over the reclassification of cannabis. I, I'm probably going over ground that David Nutt went over, but uh, essentially what happened was uh, Jackie Smith was told by Gordon Brown to deliver this policy of, uh, uh, of reclassification fundamentally to uh, keep the Daily Mail on side. And uh, uh, in order to justify it, she, uh, she, well, she asked the Advisory Council on the Misuse of Drugs to, to look at all the evidence. Uh, the, they came back and said, well, actually, no, the evidence doesn't support uh, in the round what you uh, are proposing to do. So she went through the individual bits of evidence and pulled out the one or two bits that seemed to sort of concord with, uh, uh, with her policy and, and said, well, I'll have those and uh, I'll, um, I'll use those to justify it. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's really pernicious, this, and it happens uh, again and again and again. Um, Next up, we've got uh, imaginary evidence. This is, uh, this is evidence that is either made up or is, um, uh, is so misrepresented that it might as well be made up. And uh, uh, some great examples of this have come from uh, uh, the mouth of Andrew Lansley recently over the uh, health and social care bill. Uh, he claimed, uh, for example, that there was a wide range of evidence that his uh, GP commissioning plan was the best way to, uh, uh, to improve health outcomes. And uh, Ben Goldacre had a, a look through the published data in PubMed and an archive of uh, peer-reviewed research and found absolutely nothing that, uh, that uh, concurred with, uh, with Lansley's claim uh, that there was uh, evidence. Uh, you've got fixing the evidence. Now, this is uh, uh, if you don't like the uh, advice you're getting, uh, you change the advisor. Uh, it's the reason that David Nutt was sacked. It's uh, also something that George Bush was very good at, uh, uh, stacking uh, advisory committees with people who uh, would say what he wanted to hear. And then uh, in one case, uh, in, in many cases actually, but this one is a particularly good example, uh, he, he developed this bioethics committee stacked with people who uh, opposed embryonic stem cell research. And when his sort of token scientist on there, Elizabeth Blackburn, a future Nobel laureate, uh, dissented, she was, she was effectively sacked uh, from the committee. Uh, you've then got my favorite, uh, which is clairvoyant evidence. Uh, the, the name comes from Mark Stevenson, who's talking to you next month, and uh, do go and see him. He's fantastic. Clair clairvoyant evidence is uh, best summed up by uh, one of my favorite quotes in the whole book, which is from an advisor to Patricia Hewitt, uh, the former health secretary, where she said uh, that um, home births are safe, and we will commission research to show that they are safe. <laughs> Yeah, I don't need to say anything more about that, really. Uh, you've got mishandled evidence, and this is, uh, this is subtler, but, but also really bad. Uh, it's where you have good evidence that shows one thing that's then used to justify something completely different. Uh, and the great example of that right at the moment is the Badger Cull, where uh, the government, uh, the last government actually... Uh, Rarely uh, 
put together some, some really good uh, uh, randomized controlled trials on badger culling to control uh, bovine tuberculosis. Uh, but they used the method of, uh, of trapping the badgers in cages and then shooting them uh, to, con to, to, to cull them. Uh, the policy that's now being introduced is subtly different from that. They're doing away with the cage process, so they're, they're shooting free-running badgers. Uh, and, of course, that could, as soon as you start to think about it, have very different effects because a caged badger can't run away. It can't dodge the, the bullet and uh, spread TB off into the neighboring field or the neighboring farm, whereas uh, the technique that they are using has that as a, a very strong possibility. And uh, it's, it's therefore very difficult to use the really good research that's been done to justify uh, the policy that's, that's actually being introduced. Um, finally, you've got, uh, you, you've got secret evidence. This is evidence that uh, uh, can't be challenged or scrutinized because it hasn't been published. Uh, at the moment, you've got, we've got this uh, uh, border agency crisis at, uh, at Heathrow where uh, there have been these very long queues and um, Damien Green, the immigration minister, uh, stood up in the House of Commons recently and said, well, actually, the latest statistics that I have show that the waiting times are nothing like as bad as you read in the media. Those statistics had not been published. There was no way for anybody to start questioning the methodology, going through what, what, what they did and didn't show uh, uh, and, and really holding him properly to account. Now, uh, I have to be clear here that I'm not saying uh, in all of this that uh, it's necessary always to follow the evidence and nothing but. There are all sorts of other considerations that quite properly uh, go into the policymaking process, whether it be legal considerations, economic considerations, uh, social justice, yes, even political considerations, value judgments, or the idea that uh, a politician was elected on a platform and has to fulfill that platform. These are all totally legitimate things for politicians to take into account. Uh, the problem is that they far too often don't say that that's actually why they're making the judgments that they do. They claim this kind of fig leaf of evidence for, uh, for, for, for policies that are enacted for completely different reasons. And uh, I think that devalues the whole currency of evidence. It actually makes it very difficult for anybody uh, to tell uh, who's actually following proper research and data uh, and, and who isn't. I think it's, it's pernicious and uh, it, it leads to and rewards uh, a bad policy. Of, of course, also, uh, there are times when, when politicians have to act without evidence. The evidence isn't there. Uh, the data isn't there to actually uh, describe uh, the problem, let alone tell people uh, what to do. And this is a good example. This was uh, Ayala Jokul, the, the um, Icelandic volcano that uh, erupted uh, a few years ago. And uh, uh, during this volcanic ash crisis, ministers had to take tough decisions under pressure, great time pressure, based on very little data as to what ash at this concentration actually would do to airline engines and, and therefore whether it would be safe to fly or not. Good example of, of, of ministers having to act without evidence, but also an example of another problem, which is that uh, this was a problem that could have been anticipated and wasn't. In fact, it was anticipated by the uh, British Geological Survey who approached uh, the, the government uh, a while ago and said, well, Iceland is a well-known area of volcanic activity. It's also in the middle of a transatlantic flight path. We really ought to do some risk assessment. And, and that was parked. It was ignored. Um, the time when uh, the, the, the idea that uh, politicians have to act without evidence is also uh, in many ways an opportunity uh, that isn't grasped uh, as it should be. And that, I think, is because uh, the, the final, or, or the final that I'll discuss now, way in which uh, politicians, I think, don't understand uh, enough what science has to offer is, is this. It's that, um, as Ralph Waldo Emerson said, all life is an experiment. Uh, the more experiments we make, the better. Uh, every policy that we introduce is a natural experiment, uh, whether we're changing the interest rate 
whether we're introducing a new way of teaching in schools, free schools, or uh, changing the national curriculum or whatever. All these policies are experiments, but they're not recognized as such. They're not recognized as an opportunity to actually evaluate an intervention and see uh, whether it really works. Indeed, there is very often a disincentive towards doing that evaluation. If you do the evaluation, you may discover that your cherished policy idea didn't work or was even harmful. There are all sorts of examples of this. The Scared Straight Initiative in the US, this uh, idea that um, uh, you could uh, potentially put troubled teenagers off crime by taking them to visit prisons and sort of see uh, how people turn out. Brilliant idea in theory, led to more crime in practice. Uh, it's, it's the sort of thing that you'll never find out if you don't actually do the tests, if you don't actually bother to uh, evaluate the policy interventions uh, that you undertake. Of course, also, science has come up with really good ways, really good methods of testing different approaches. When we take a drug, we assume that that drug has been assessed by randomized controlled trials quite properly. They are the best way that there is of evaluating one intervention against another intervention. You know because you are randomly assigning people to one group or the other that you've minimized the sources of bias and it's actually the intervention uh, that makes a difference. We could do this far more often. We could do it so much in social policy. We could do it in education. Do we want to know whether phonics is the best way to teach kids to read? Well, I think it's potentially an interesting idea. There is very little good data on it. We could, when phonics first started to become fashionable 10 years ago, have started a proper randomized controlled trial of phonics that would have answered that question by now. Whereas as it is, uh, we're hand-waving. Both sides of the debate are hand-waving. We simply don't know the answer. Uh, the same is true of criminal justice. If we want to design sentencing policies that uh, reduce reoffending, again, we can do trials. We can do proper trials where we randomize the sentence uh, to one group or another in order to actually tell which is, which is better. Uh, there are far fewer ethical and practical barriers to doing this than, than, than is often uh, assumed. Uh, people sometimes say that it's, it's unethical to do experiments with kids' education. Well, I would argue that we're already uh, experimenting with kids' education because we don't know what the best way to teach them is. Uh, the thing is, though, that we're doing the most unethical kind of experiment, which is an experiment where you don't bother to collect the data properly. That's, that's, that's where we are, I think, at the moment. And it's something uh, that I think having a, a bigger cadre of, of, of people in Parliament who kind of uh, understand these scientific approaches to thinking and what they might have to offer uh, would really uh, help. Um, why, why does all of this happen? Well, it, it doesn't happen, as I said at the beginning, because most politicians are like David Tredinick. They're not anti-science. They're not hostile to all of this. The, the, the bigger problem is they just haven't thought about it, the vast majority of them. Uh, they're, they're indifferent. They're ignorant of science in the totally non-pejorative sense of just not knowing very much about it. They haven't stopped to think why they might benefit from building a randomized controlled trial into a policy. Uh, they, they don't know that the proper way to assess evidence is not just to pick out the bits that, uh, that support your uh, preconceived idea of what the right thing to do is. And uh, I think there's a really simple reason, uh, ultimately, why this happens. And it is ultimately down to us here. Uh, we let this kind of evidence abuse, this kind of uh, uh, approach to science happen. Uh, we don't create a, a political cost to those politicians who let science down, whether in its management or in its use uh, in, in public policy. It's simply not a, a, a political issue most of the time. Uh, politicians know that they don't actually have to engage with science because there are no votes in it. They're not going to get lobbied, by and large, by uh, people uh, like us to actually uh, change things. Um, 
it's only, I think, really through creating that political cost, through uh, kind of forcing politicians to engage, to make themselves informed about these issues, uh, that we ultimately stand a chance uh, of changing this uh, for the better. And I'm optimistic that we can and indeed, I think in many ways we already are. As I said right at the beginning, uh, the existence of skeptics in the pub, the fact that I've been able to talk about this kind of thing to uh, audiences of this size in several towns all over the place, uh, the fact that, um, uh, that there's this kind of... Um, been this sort of groundswell of uh, sort of uh, skeptic pride, geek pride over the last uh, uh, few years that sort of uh, brought science and curiosity and critical thinking up to a, a place to enjoy a place in popular culture that I don't think it's enjoyed really for some time where uh, you have the success of people like uh, Brian Cox and Ben Goldacre and the sort of, uh, uh, the sort of uh, comedy that Robin Ince and Tim Minchin do. Uh, sort of showing that science is cool. It's cool to think uh, in, in a way that um, I don't think it was uh, not that long ago. Uh, and this manifests itself, I think, in, in, in all sorts of uh, interesting things. There's Simon Singh, the, uh, uh, the libel case that he thought over these, I think, really quite reasonable and moderate remarks about the effectiveness of chiropractic, uh, w was a really important event uh, for, for a number of reasons, because when, when Simon was sued for libel by the British Chiropractic Association, because of the way in which libel law is so iniquitous and puts such demands on the, uh, uh, on, on the defendant, uh, he was really close to throwing the towel in uh, until he got this sort of groundswell of support from, uh, uh, from uh, people like yourselves, from, like ourselves, who who felt that this was a really important issue and, and, and stood up and backed him, blogged about it, went to public meetings, signed petitions, uh, complained about chiropractors, so turning round the, uh, uh, the, um, uh, the lawsuit to create a cost for those who'd brought it. Uh, and then what was critical was this groundswell, this popular movement uh, in support of Simon and of libel reform uh, was channeled then very effectively by uh, Sense About Science and uh, Index on Censorship and other groups to, to create a proper campaign for libel reform that uh, lobbied the right MPs exhaustively, got a commitment into the, uh, uh, the manifestos of all three main political parties. And I think as a direct... Um, consequence of what geeks and nerds and skeptics did over that case, uh, we now have a libel reform bill going uh, through Parliament. It's not perfect. Uh, it needs to be improved. Uh, but it's a hell of a lot of an improvement on, on where we went, where we were before. Um, what else can we do, though? I mean, I think there are uh, there's, there's, there's some potential in, in our voting behavior and our general political behavior. I think we need uh, to make sure that although uh, we in this room, I'm sure, have a diversity of political views and uh, may normally vote for different parties and will uh, decide the way we vote on many, according to many, many, many issues, we need to make sure that actually science and uh, the approach that politicians take to evidence is one of those issues. And I'm not sure that we do uh, enough uh, at present. Do we actually look into uh, the records and the views of the candidates in our constituency on these kind of issues uh, before we decide whether to vote for them or not? I personally now would not support uh, a candidate who, might, who I might otherwise support, uh, who might be for the party that I intend to vote for at that election. I wouldn't support a candidate now who had uh, issues, who had views on science that, uh, uh, that I would consider to be potentially damaging. Equally, I would be prepared to support a candidate of another party who I thought was um, particularly good uh, on scientific issues. We need this not actually to be a party political issue. We need people uh, who value and understand science uh, in, in all the main parties. Um, I think there is a, a huge amount more that we can do uh, in lobbying. And uh, uh, by lobbying, I mean um, not necessarily the sort of uh, uh, aggressive lobbying that... Uh, 
telling, their, telling your MP they're stupid or, or, or whatever, but actually approaching them as sort of critical friends and uh, bringing, the, bringing to them information uh, that they can uh, potentially use and acting as good citizens, remembering that uh, your, your MP is there to represent you and to a point has to listen to your views. And uh, I spent some time um, uh, last year with um, uh, Nicola Blackwood, who's um, uh, Tory MP for Oxford West and Abingdon. She uh, is not a scientist by training at all, uh, knew very little about it. She took, place, she took part uh, last year in a scientist MP pairing scheme organized by the Royal Society. And uh, what she told me here about uh, the importance of her post bag uh, is, is really interesting, I think, because what she said is, uh, to, to me was that when she gets uh, a very large volume of correspondence from constituents all saying uh, similar things about a similar issue, it doesn't make her feel duty-bound to agree with those constituents and necessarily support them, uh, but it makes her damn sure that she's going to get properly informed about that issue. Uh, it makes her realize that, you know, this is something I need to know about. Uh, I need to make sure that uh, I engage with this issue, work out what I think. And that, I think, is half the struggle. It's uh, a matter of um, encouraging politicians to, uh, to, to engage, to uh, start to look at what science might have to offer to, say, uh, increasing economic growth or delivering sounder policy. And um, I don't think that uh, most politicians are evil or venal or corrupt. Uh, I think very large numbers of them can uh, potentially be uh, turned on to the sort of thinking that we value uh, if we approach them and engage with them uh, in the right way. Uh, what else can we do? Well, we can also, I think, the, the scientific community, the sceptical community, uh, has not been good at, uh, at engaging and using um, organizations that can lobby on our behalf. I, just an interesting straw poll. Are any of you members of the Campaign for Science and Engineering? Is that a hand at the back? No, it's not. Okay. <laughs> um, the Campaign for Science and Engineering is a terrific uh, group who uh, are probably the best lobby organization for science that uh, is around. Um, they currently have about 1,000 uh, individual members, uh, therefore low budgets. They can't do that much. Their lobbying was instrumental in getting the uh, worst effects of the immigration cap uh, overturned for science. And uh, it costs £2.50 a month to join that body. They can do a huge, they could do so much more uh, with more support and, uh, and, and greater resources. Uh, I think we can also do uh, more uh, to think innovatively about um, uh, how we might uh, bring pressure to bear about some of the issues we care about. We can blog, as I'm sure many of you do. Uh, we can use the media, and uh, uh, if anybody wants to bring that up in questions, I'd be very happy to uh, uh, talk in more detail about the, uh, uh, the media. Uh, we can campaign. Uh, the uh, Things like the 1023 campaign that many of you in this room were instrumental in setting up can, I think, have a really... Uh, a important impact uh, in a couple of ways. I think they can start to change minds, but uh, they also embolden uh, the people who participate in them. They, uh, uh, just as, uh, as, as social media uh, and things like skeptics in the pub sort of leave us all a little more convinced that we're not lone wolves out there sort of uh, uh, baying at the moon. Sorry, back to Tridinic there. But, uh, um, that, but that we actually uh, are part of a bigger movement, that there are others who share our views, and that if we get together, we have a chance of, of actually uh, doing something. We can join parties. Uh, I, I think um, that uh, scientists and uh, uh, geeks and skeptics in general have, um, have not been uh, good at, uh, at engaging actively in the political process from within. I, I have a, a couple of theories as to... Uh, why this might be, uh, some of their, their, their hand-waving, they are decidedly not evidence-based. Um, 
One of them is that uh, uh, I think the facility that science has with the U-turn, with changing your mind, uh, is something that puts a lot of people off uh, entering an arena where that uh, immediately becomes very, very difficult. Um, the other one is that, uh, so I did a history degree uh, when I was at Oxford uh, University, uh, there were a large number of, I, I was very engaged in student politics and student media. Um, all the other people who were engaged in those pursuits as well were also humanities students. Uh, I think that those networks and habits of behavior that you form potentially at that age, particularly in universities, uh, can be very influential on your subsequent behavior. And my suspicion is that uh, more uh, humanities students get involved than science students simply because uh, uh, we have more time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> knowing, knowing laughs from the scientists in the audience. But uh, it is true that, uh, that scientists have more commitments at, uh, uh, to, to spend time in labs and lectures and, and so on. Uh, uh, but back to the point of, uh, of, of joining a party, well, if there is a party you normally support, uh, you can actually start to have influence over the candidates they select. You can potentially at one, some stage even stand as a candidate yourself. Um, candidates are often selected by a surprisingly small number of activists within constituencies, and uh, there's a real opportunity, I think, for uh, us to get more uh, actively involved. Uh, ultimately, uh, I really do think that um, uh, the, the answers to uh, the sort of problems I talked about in the first half of the talk uh, today uh, are, are really uh, up to us. It's uh, very much the case that uh, politics and public policy will start to do science better, to use science better, uh, when science uh, and those of us who care about science uh, start to do politics better, start to engage, start to lobby, uh, start to become active citizens uh, in, in the way uh, that it's all of our rights uh, to be. I will... Um, leave it there. Thank you very much for listening and um, uh, always the best bit of skeptics in the pub is the questions so I will look forward to that uh, very much indeed. Thank you very much.